good time to turn to our audience, because in our audience, and I think there's a microphone coming around soon, we have a representative from one of the key vertical markets for 5G, broadcast, and from IBC, we have Jessica Lapsiwala. Jessica, um, could, you, could you stand up there so we can see where, where, you, where you are? I'm embarrassed you. Here we go. Um, Jessica is head of content at IBC, and if you've not attended the IBC event in Amsterdam, I urge you to go this year because it is total broadcast. Everything you want to know about broadcast is at IBC. Jessica, I'd like to ask you the same question I asked our, our panel of, of, of telecoms experts here. What does 5G mean to the broadcast industry? Um, I think um, 5G is a, an enabler of content and obviously essential for that sports, you know, for the sports industry, the sports market. And um, my question was really about, my observations here at, at Mobile World Congress have really been about hearing what people are saying about the link between um, content and media. And in fact, the, there's a track, a whole track in the conference on content and media. Um, and there clearly is a need for the two um, industries to come together and collaborate. Um, but my question to the panel really is about, in your list of priorities, um, where do you see the, the collaboration between content providers and telcos um, sitting in that list of priorities? And secondly, if it is high on the list of priorities, um, how do you see those business models working? Where is there opportunity for monetization, which will benefit both the, um, the broadcast industry and the telecoms industry? Thank you very much. Who, who would like to address first? Howard. I mean, I mean great question. and. Um, I mean, from, from my perspective, um, you know, we run a global media and broadcast business uh, doing transmission of media content, and of course we have uh, unique sport content. If I take the first of that piece, um, I actually think we, we will revolutionize the sort of content contribution uh, part of that end-to-end -end, end -to -end value chain. And um, on one of the stands in the show here, the Nokia stand, if I'm allowed to say that, we're... Uh, we're demonstrating BT Sport contribution using 5G new radio, um, and we can see real transformation there. And then I think you're right, for content that we own the production of, that's where we really do have the opportunity to you know, do what's just happened um, at the Winter Olympics and create really unique, compelling experiences uh, for customers, both in stadium you know, and and away from that, watching it live. And I think that's really exciting for us. Caroline, you, you, you bit, Intel's been doing an awful lot with, with sports, for instance, right. and the, 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 the fan experience. That to, to contribute and... Uh, look at I mean, the, 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 definitely the rights, the content providers, is a huge, important part of being able to deliver this. Especially, like, um, Intel just set up a uh, studio in uh, LA, the Los Angeles area, that we we started looking at ways of uh, delivering content. In, in fact, in CES, we just showed this, our CEO just showed this. There was an old Western movie where a guy in a horse rode into town and shot a guy. So they started taking that movie clip and show it from the guy that shot the, the guy's point of view, and then the victim's point of view, and then the horse's <laughs> point of view. <laughs> Think about that. You take the same content, but you change the angle, you customize it for the audience. Maybe I want to see that. Maybe I don't all, like, maybe I'm looking at the bob, uh, the bob sledding. Maybe I want to see the, the driver, the guy in the back, the audience. You know, different angles to personalize, personalize the content. For, so you can make money three times over. So for the content owners, you make money three times over. The delivery person, be it BT or at t you can make money in different ways. And I was just saying in our panel that the Chinese always worry about the winner, the losers, and who makes the money. You take this whole angle, and you can literally monetize it multiple times. So it becomes a really data-centric type of scenario. If we, any kind of any kind of sports or event becomes an entertainment that you can monetize it multiple times. That really becomes a, a, a opportunity for everybody. Having just, just, I'll come to you in a, in a second, Roy, but having been in the back of a bobsleigh, can I just say, 
<laughs> I didn't see a thing, and I didn't want to see a thing either. <laughs> I wouldn't pay for that. However... <laughs> on a horse, though. On a horse, that's different. Roy. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, everything we've talked about, when you boil it down to the fundamentals, it's data, right? Mm -hmm. And I think Robert mentioned earlier, what can we do to get that data off the network faster? So to the content providers and everybody else, what we really need to be able to do is get the right workloads in the right place. Because um, if you're going to meet one millisecond you know, latency across an end-to-end -end, uh, experience, that's going to require something different than we've been doing. So, so it really is about offloading that data as fast as we can, getting the right workloads um, where you need to have them. Otherwise, that experience, you know, as, as fun as that all sounds, if you're sitting there and you're waiting for it to load or whatever, mm -hmm. and it just takes your whole network down, it's no good. And you don't want it jamming up all your other mission-critical op operations as well. We, we, we've had a, a, an example here, a very, very simple example of dialogue between one of those key vertical industries and the telecoms industry. Now, we are not usually very good at that kind of dialogue. How, this is going to be so important. Dialogue and cooperation is going to be so very, very important as we move forward. How do we ensure this doesn't all fall apart and that we engage correctly with these industries and, and understand their expectations and what they really want from us and what we can deliver? Who would like to tackle that tricky well, I, one? I, I think it starts with the imagination, right? Once you see an experience at the Olympics or in the back of a bobsled, it changes your, your life, right? Um, and I think our customers um, need to be engaged. We definitely need more investment in proof of concepts. We need to go stand up our trials. We need to go push the edge of what can be done, because I think um, our enterprise customers are looking for better efficiency, better cost management, looking to differentiate. These are business problems that have been here 100 years. This is a new technology that's coming. Well, how are we going to do that and disrupt? Uh, they're looking to disrupt their marketplace, their segments. Um, I think you had a terrific question. And um, what I love about the European football or soccer game is it doesn't stop like American football. Like we stop every you know, 30 <laughs> seconds, take a break, commercial breaks. It doesn't stop. But one of the things I missed, so when Messi scored his two goals this week, there was no replay. But imagine a stadium of 95,000 people, everyone getting broadcast, the replay, multiple angles. I think it would just enrich the experience and uh, would differentiate kind of that on-site, in-game experience in that particular area. But we're going to have to get a lot smarter. We're going to have to partner um, with different players um, and understand what they're trying to do. What are you trying to do in retail? What are you trying to do in the fast serve? What are you trying to do in manufacturing? What are your business problems in your digital transformation? And go attack it with them. What's different this time around? You know, yet another G. 5G is an evolution of where we've been with a 3GPP process and, and, and LTE, but there's some serious new architecture and systems going on here. What are the unique attributes of, of 5G that make it so applicable and attractive to these large enterprise sectors? Howard? I mean, I mean, the one that I'm most excited about in that context is the ability to do a much better job of fixed mobile convergence. So, you know, bringing the, the capability of really ultra-fast fixed um, aligned with the architecture that 5G <coughs> presents, um, you know, and using that in a, in a clever end-to-end -end way with network slicing and opportunities such as that. So I think those are the novel pieces that we uh, are all excited about. You know, finding the revenue stream <laughs> that uh, encourages rapid rollout of that is is the current challenge. Francisco. I, I th what uh, makes it different? I, I think that the, is, as we were mentioning, is, the, is that the ability to manage uh, the, manage that network differently. I mean, it's, it's not just uh, the pure evolution of the technology that obviously it is, but also the the ability to create uh, that connectivity in a, in a way that is efficient and, and is worth the effort. I mean, le let's talk about the, the the horses in the race. I mean. How expensive could it be to set up that uh, infrastructure ad hoc when you don't have enough capacity, when you don't have, I mean, it's not trivial unless you know that you, will, uh, you are in the Olympics or you are, but actually what is uh, at stake here is the ability to create it in an ad hoc fashion. 
because you essentially have all the all the ability and all the all the enablers ready to commercialize it. So it's a matter to finding someone who has the, the, the demand and you can offer it. So far from, from the demand to the offer, there are many things that happen in the middle. A lot of engineering, a lot of uh, uh, cases in what if, and, 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 and a lot of hidden costs there. Actually, what 5G enables you is to remove many of those costs and have it ready and normalize the procedure for, for that kind. So, so yes, we can have the 3D, uh, uh, the immersive experience, not only because it's technologically possible, that is possible today, but also because it's feasible from the perspective of the business. And, and I think that that is the differential. Very good. I think this could be a good opportunity to um, throw this open to our audience. Um, do we have some, I'm sure we do, do we have a question or two from our audience? It's a little bit dark for us up here at stage, but um, oh, in the center, I think I saw a hand go up. Some? Okay. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Steve Marsh. I'm from a, a technology company based in Cambridge called Geospock. And um, I'm personally extremely excited by 5G and the future use cases that enables. Um, but those new applications of the future are going to be very data hungry. Uh, and 5G, as you are rightly said, it's a step change. We're going to go from the drip feed to the fire hose. We're going to go from big data to extreme data. And given that we're already struggling to handle the data that's being generated today, what is your strategy for handling the extreme data problems of the future? Because until we solve those, I don't think the, the value of 5G will be fully crystallized. Thank you. Uh, Roy, Roy, do you want to take us? First at that. And, and you're exactly right. I mean, that really is, in my opinion, the hurdle for the ultimate realization of this ubiquitous connectivity um, because it is, it's, it's petabytes for everything that we're talking about. But that's also going to be trans transitional uh, in a way as well. And so for me, it really is about the right workloads at the right place. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to change the way you architect your network. We're going to have to get more aggressive about the things we put out at the edge. Um, how long they stay out at the edge, you know, what, how do we refresh? I mean, it brings the idea of caching to a whole new level, right? Um, and to kind of tie it back into your previous question, Guy, the way I think we facilitate 5G being adopted is it can't be just these giant RFPs that go flying out, right? And everybody just bids on them and we see who the winner and the losers are. It, I think it's going to have to be much more collaborative because we're going to have to take this off in chunks because some of the technology will be ready sooner than others. And so if we can peel off those pieces, get some quick wins, if I can say, if a quick win means five years or whatever, but a, a quick win under our belt, um, as opposed to, you know, when, you know, I was a part of the 3G and 4G transformation, those were some pretty big, just kind of drop them into the network sort of plays. I don't think we can do that with 5G, because as you say, you're going to have to look at, with the content providers, what's the heuristic, right? What's the analytics telling you that you need to do? And then you're going to have to, you're going to have to experiment with it. And that's, that's what makes the ROI scary for folks. And I, and I get that. I get that. How is it? I mean, one, just to build on that, one of the things I notice in the, if you like, the 5G sort of ecosystem that we're, that's very active, as we can see here this week, um, is that I think the industry has done a good job in the macro sense, so you know the large operators with the large vendors have pushed the standards a little bit earlier than we thought, you know, and we've got a roadmap of what we're going to deliver there. But actually, what's I think equally as exciting is to see the amount of potential disruptors uh, that are out there inventing technology to deal with specific applications. Um, I mean, we're, for example, together on the telecoms infrastructure project and you know part of that is to encourage you know potential disruptive suppliers with great technology who can start to tackle some of these unique you know I mean because I think the one thing we'll see and with hyper data is sometimes the processing at the edge will work you know other times we're gonna have to backhaul it lug it right back into some central point um, and I think you know getting some disruptive capabilities into our supply chain for those solutions is what is what I see at the moment.